Hey, anyway, Shannon, how's it going? Ben, not too bad. Prone boy, books going forward and bank holidays. <laughs> but apart from that, I'm good. Yeah, cool. Yeah, give it a week, you'll be all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, you're right, Martin. So, thanks for saying hi. Uh, as always, this isn't legal advice, usual blurb. Um, please don't share personal data in the chat. Just ask questions as if they're about a hypothetical third person. So just ask what if questions, you'll get the same answer and you don't have to splurge your data on the internet to get the answer. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Um, I, we tried last week to experiment and see if liking and sharing this video does anything. It doesn't seem to do anything, but if you do want to like the video, feel free to. Um, it doesn't appear to have, uh, affect reach, but who knows. Um, hey, right, Reza. Um, so we haven't had any questions in in this week that we're going to answer tonight. I want Will to be here next week when we answer a couple of questions because they're quite technical ones. That I'd rather have a solicitor answer rather than us two because we're not solicitors. So, um, yeah, bear with us on that. Um, we're going to get an answer as quick as we can. Who else? Other bits and pieces. Um, I'm going to go through a bit of a thing I'll be working on this week in a minute. Other than that, there's not a whole lot of gossip. I don't think it's Easter week. I think it's been a bit quiet everywhere. So, um, in fact, I'm just going to get it up now. So, um, basically, oh, where's, what have I done with it? Uh, I was tasked by an organisation to do a flow chart of the homeless application process. And it's something I've tried before. And it's so complicated, I've kind of given up. But, um, but I basically had another go at it. I've got a big bit of flip chart and loads of little bits of paper cut out and shuffled them around. And I think I've got something which is close to being ready to actually I mean, i'm going to share it widely when it's actually done but i thought i'd just kind of talk you through a bit of it because we've had questions before on the channel about having a video which is all encompassing on the homeless application process if if nothing else this flow chart just makes it clear how ridiculously complicated this all, all is and it doesn't even have all of it in there because i've left out the prevention duty altogether so that, so um let me zoom out a little bit oh that's not allowing me to do that awesome how do i zoom in there we go yeah there we go so that's that's the flow chart in its entirety for the time being but obviously it's too small to read. So if I zoom right in and I'll give you a whistle stop tour of it. So I've, I've basically grouped these different bits into the initial stages, the relief stage, which is this green bit. And then this is kind of the end stage here. I actually ran out of free shapes on this software, so I'm not going to pay for it yet. So I'm going to kind of leave it in this state until I've got a bit more feedback on it. But basically the initial stages, um, might as well go through it and, you know, just kind of as we go. So you've got the person approaching the council and asking for help, which gives the council reasons to believe they might be homeless. So that basically triggers section 184. Um, and then between me and Shannon, we kind of discussed the fact that actually in, in uh, certainly unitary councils, other duties would, would potentially trigger at this point as well. So again, under the CARE Act 2014, if it appears that an, an individual has uh, needs for care and support, then the council's under a duty to actually carry out an assessment of those needs. And LGO reports have been clear that that could easily be triggered in the homeless application process because you know part of the inquiries are going to be about what, what disabilities the person might have, what other kind of support issues they might have. And so actually Section 9 may well be triggered and that leads to a social worker actually kind of undertaking an assessment and might lead to further support. Now, we talk about gatekeeping of homelessness law. Um, social care law is just the same so uh maybe even worse i don't know so this is really actually going to happen in the real world but we're trying to here to actually give like a technical kind of like you know, explanation of the homes application process so you've also got this duty that councils have if you make it clear to them that you have a disability or somebody in your household has a disability then it then becomes under this kind of requirement to carry out a kind of careful consideration of that disability and work out what they need to do with it. I appreciate that I've just seen some typos in this already, but yeah, it's in draft stage. And then it actually kind of comes back to the homeless application process. So if at that stage there's reason to believe that the person might be homeless, might be eligible, might be in priority need, then interim accommodation is secured immediately, which kind of takes us over here. And then there's a few boxes there, I mean, you can pause it if you really want to kind of go into detail on it. But um it's basically kind of saying how that duty can be ended. For example, if the council finishes their inquiries and realises the person is not eligible or is not homeless, then that duty would end. And equally, if the person doesn't engage with the, the kind of temporary combination or they kind of, I don't know, break the rules or something, then again, that would potentially bring the interim uh, accommodation duty to an end. Um, so it can kind of end up kind of going back into the, the main process. As I say, I hope this makes some sense. Um, You've then kind of got this sequence of inquiries that the council has to go into. And initially, well, technically, they've got to look at eligibility first. 
And if they are eligible, then they kind of take it onto the question of whether they're actually homeless. Um, and that's when the relief duty then kicks in. So the relief duty kicks in at the moment the council ha is satisfied that the person is homeless and is eligible. If they're not homeless or not eligible, they basically get a not eligible or not homeless decision, which gives a, a right to review. And if your situation then changes, you kind of go back to the start and make a fresh application or approach a different council, I guess. Um, so yeah, relief duty kicks in, which is this green box. And then you've kind of got the needs assessment, which is done first, which is why did you become homeless? What type of accommodation do you need and what support do you need to maintain it? And then you collaborate with the personalized housing plan. And then you've got one of four things that could happen, um, largely speaking. So councils can make um, what I call an informal offer. So it doesn't have a name for it, which makes it very confusing. But that's basically when the council might say, well, you know, if, if you move in with your family, you can stay there for at least six months so we can end the duty that way. But that doesn't satisfy the, 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 the criteria for a final accommodation or for a final part six offer. So in theory, you could turn that down. And the worst thing that they can happen is that they would then say that you're not cooperating and they would have to issue a final decision then, um, which I'll come back to in a minute. As I say, it gets really complicated. You've then got this final accommodation offer potential. So if they make the offer and they do it properly and you turn it down, then you either need to win the review request or it's the end of the road for you. Basically, the, the kind of that's it. Um, or you accept the final accommodation offer and that's, you know, you're no longer homeless. So that would need to be at least an assured short haul tenancy for six months. You've got the final part six offer, which similarly is kind of an offer of social housing, which you don't have a lot of choice about, if any. And again, if you're going to turn it down, you are playing with fire um, and we would highly recommend that you don't do that. So we'd always recommend that you accept the accommodation, then ask for a review of the suitability, because if you lose, again, it's the end of the road. Um, you know, the council doesn't have to do anything else, even if you are in priority need, and even if you're not intentionally homeless. Um, they can also kind of do other, other offers which don't satisfy those kind of previous criteria, but they could make a, some kind of um, offer of accommodation that's maybe through a rent deposit scheme or something like that, which could do the job. But crucially, they don't actually have to do anything in the relief period at all. They can just let it run through. So they don't have to make an offer at that point. So the end thing gets into the relief duty, which is on day 57. Um, so it's 56 days it runs for. So day 57, they issue a final decision, which is when your assessment of priority need and intentional homelessness and local connection and stuff will kick in. I, I mentioned actually, I missed the back up here. Local connection can actually kick in up here before the relief duty starts as well. So councils can choose to do it one way or the other. And obviously, they're going to probably choose to do it earlier in the process so they save money. So that's kind of how it's going to work. So um, also, at that point, your interim accommodation becomes temporary accommodation, which means you've now got a right to review um, without going to court. <clears throat> and you might be there for years, so it has to be probably more it has to be more suitable than the interim accommodation was, if that makes sense. And then you've kind of got these other kind of bits and pieces of also main homelessness duty, um, if you didn't cooperate in the relief stage, they could just charge the main duty through a final accommodation or for a final part six offer. Um, and there are other things they can do. But as I say, that's kind of, that's as far as I've got with it, really, which I'm hoping covers most of the bases with the homes application process. I need to insert in there about the prevention duty because that kind of sits outside of it at the top of it, really. So, um, but yeah, as I say, I'm hoping that this will help people understand the process and where things should happen and, and kind of and we can actually go into a bit more detail on some of these as well but yeah that's that's what we're working on at the moment so i'm hoping to kind of be able to publish that properly at some point i've seen i've did google for ones on the internet and actually i never found one which went into an, an, you know, an adequate amount of detail really because it's it the, the, the detail matters it's all in the detail that these things work or they don't work so anyway thought that'd be interesting uh, interesting people hey you right nick um I think it'd so, be good as well um, to have like bit going alongside it. Basically, I don't know whether it'd have to be a separate flow chart, but letting people know what their responsibilities are at each point. So, you know, at this stage, this is when you have to provide bank statements for three months, or this is when you have to do this sort of paperwork. Um like the tips and tricks that you talk about most weeks, you know, you don't need ID at that beginning stage, but you'll probably need ID further down the line. Um, you don't need, you know whatever whatever stage but you do need it at this stage and those sorts of things would be handy for people i think as well just knowing yeah this is what the council's doing and this is what i need to be doing um because yeah, i think yeah. sometimes the council can sort of say oh you need to be doing this and actually they don't need to be or they really do um but you don't quite understand what's important and what's not 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean that it could get quite expensive because we could then actually also kind of put in different quotes from the code of guidance and LJ reports and stuff, which just illustrate the points that we're making. So yeah, I think as I say, it's a working document, but I'm hoping we're kind of getting. As I say, t I, I thought it, this would take me half a day. It's taken me ages. So um, yeah. Anyway, cool. Right. Question in the live stream. Um, someone is in temporary accommodation. They've let the council know that their health conditions, which include unexpected vertigo attacks which they require grab rails for. The shower in the temporary population has no grab rails. The person had vertigo attack in the shower and then had a fall. They went to any um, to check everything was okay. They didn't sprain or even break their arm as they were in a lot of pain. Thankfully, enough, nothing serious happened. They're now scared they may slip and fall again. Um, this would not have happened if the council listened. What would the advice be that they should do now to achieve a solution for this to not happen again? So um, I think with something like this, you know, council should take your word for it first and make investigations into it and see if, if it's correct or not. Um, but in the real world, you probably want to get a letter from a GP or something just kind of explaining something that's, you know, whatever's going on. It depends then on the type of temporary accommodation it is, because if the, if the council own it, then they could quite easily install grab rails. It wouldn't be difficult, but they might involve social care or something to, to kind of do that. Or you could go down the social care route. Um, if, you know, if you're having falls and stuff, then you might be able to get some help through social services if you can kind of batter through their gatekeeping practices as well. So I think, you know, and and other, and as well as that, you can complain and involve local politicians and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a difficult one to kind of win on really. It's kind of, yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, you might have to, by the, yeah, by the time the complaint actually resolved anything, it might be irrelevant by that point anyway, because you might well be housed elsewhere by then, but you, I, I would kind of certainly continue kind of making the point that that's that's the situation and ask them to put that um you know put a grab rail in as i say it's not that expensive to do and if you want to take it down the complaint route i think make a subject access request to get a, a copy of their notes so you can then when you make the complaint you're then referring to the records they've got so you can kind of say you know this time you received this email from me which said this stuff and they you can show if they had actually kind of made any consideration of that at all because often they won't have so you can kind of actually start pinning the complaint together on that. Now, you don't have to wait to get the subject access request to actually start complaining. You can do it straight away and make the subject access request on the same day because you can guarantee you're not going to exhaust the council's complaints process by the time you get those records back. So you could start the first stage complaint, you know, however long they've got to respond to that. Hopefully by the stage they've responded, you've then got the subject access request documents and you can then you know, kind of go further in the stage two complaint. I've said it before, stage one complaints rarely work. You need to go to stage two or to the ombudsman. So, um, but yeah, having some sort of medical backup of that is going to help. Um, they should, you know, they should take people's word for it if they're saying that there's an issue, particularly when you're not asking to be moved or you're not asking for anything unreasonable there. You're just saying, can there be some grab rails in there? It's not difficult. So I think that would be something that I'd probably say a way of doing it. But I'm not sure. I can't think of any LJ cases where, that sort of thing has been picked up by the LGO. So, yeah, um, it might be a case of just just kind of trying your best to, you know, or, or, I don't know, even even sort of seeing if there's other ways of kind of uh, achieving the same goal. I'm not quite sure how you do it. But certainly you could speak to your GP and see if you can get maybe an OT assessment because, yeah, if you're falling over and injuring yourself, it's clearly quite serious. So um, that's probably what I'd say about that one. Uh, Shannon, anything to add? Yeah, I guess... I mean, you could also raise safeguarding alerts um, out, whether it's yourself or your friend or whatever, um, and potentially as well highlight the, you know, if you're scared of showering, you're less likely to shower, which potentially leads to neglect, which potentially leads to, you know, it, it's definitely one of those things that I think can be a snowball effect as well and on other issues. And I'm not saying this person has other issues, but often it can exacerbate those things. It's worth, I mean, you could go down the review route, but again, I think the, the council's less likely to sort of relocate you. And um, maybe as well being, I don't want to use the word creative, but if you are able to get someone to install the grab rails and first check with the council, but if you were to say to the council, look, I've got a friend, they can install the grab rails. And this is how much it costs. Am I right to go ahead with this and then, you know, give you the receipts? They are very much less likely to do that, purely because when I've seen it happen before, occupational health have to come in. They do certain measurements. They check the suitability of the whole bathroom. 
Um, but it's worth, you know, temporarily you could put them up and then they could do that because occupational health has waiting lists. Um, and it's one of those really horrible situations where you're in a really, you know, bad situation yourself and you're going to get told that there are people worse off than you. So there are people ahead of you in that waiting list. Um, and that's really hard when everything else is going on and, you know, you're in temporary accommodation and what have you and you're, you're facing everything else. But it's worth sort of bearing that in mind. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that was any help for advice yeah. or just a bit of doom. I think, I think um, in my experience, the housing officers you speak to are, are unlikely to let you go ahead and try and install them yourself. So, you know, you do with it, do with that what you want to do with it. Um, you know, in terms of the worst thing that can happen is you try and install them yourself and crack a few tiles or something, or, you know, something else goes wrong. And then the landlord, if, if it's a private landlord, then the private landlord might well look to claim claim them, you know, kind of claim damages off or whatever. So I think it would depend on, yeah, as I say, who, who owns that temporary accommodation property. But if it's council owned, then it's in their interest to have grab rails in there because you're not going to be the first and the last person that needs them. So it's well worth raising. Again, you know, involve your local politicians and kind of just make that point. I think, unfortunately, vertigo is one of those things which I think a lot of housing officers are sceptical of for no good reason. They're just I don't know, some, some housing officers are just wired like that, I think. So getting some kind of medical backup of, of what's happened, even if it's just a hospital report, you know, you've gone in there and you've reported this to them and that, that might help just kind of make it a bit more obvious to them that they actually need to do something. They can't just, you know, kind of wish it away or whatever. So, yeah, I think... um. I know that's hopefully there's some helpful stuff in there, uh, but yeah, certainly continue to raise it, but don't expect a quick outcome, unfortunately. So, um, you know, you're gonna have to keep running through with it until you get an outcome, I think. It's probably um, one of those things as well that's worth mentioning in your like personal housing plan. Um, because when the, the council starts looking at final, you know, accommodation offers, actually, they can make that a suitable before you move in. Um, so potentially it's one of the things that they need to consider before you move into like settled accommodation that they need to install handrails and it might be depending on the waiting list it might be 18 months on the waiting list you could get put on the waiting list for that adjustment potentially before you've even got an offer of accommodation just so your name's on there um it's worth just yeah including it yeah yeah um and it might be there's some local knowledge, local agencies as well that might be able to kind of give some advice and assistance around that. So, as I say, it's, 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 one, of those, it's one of those things It's not difficult for a count, you know, it's not, it's not a difficult thing to fix the issue, um, but the bureaucracy will make it difficult. So I think just just persevere. Um, and as I, yeah, Shanna says, you know, getting stuff done now is going to hopefully improve your circumstances actually when, when you get to the top of that waiting list anyway. Um, how are you, Andrew? You are, Geraldine? Um, so... Um, thanks. Yeah, Martin just just said about the, uh, the the flow chart we just looked at. Um, so yeah, that's cool. I like that. Just kind of making clear on the thresholds. So I'm, I'll save this chat. I'm going to save that bit now before I forget. I have turned the AI thing on again this week, but I'm not sure if it's working or not. It didn't work last week. Um, but we'll see what happens. So um, next question: uh, How many times can you do a housing application to be accepted on the housing register? Is there a limit, especially if you've been accepted as homeless now? If you've been accepted as homeless, you automatically, so let, I'm assuming you're still in temporary accommodation at this point. If you've been accepted as homeless, um, you will have reasonable preference for the housing register, which means you'll get some kind of banding for it. And I think I, I think I recognise this, this person, I think they've asked questions around this before. So I think, you know, the, the kind of key thing here is to work out, um, you know, what stage is the homeless application at? You know, have they just accepted you're homeless and you're in the relief stage, or have they accepted as a main duty and you're in temporary accommodation, or, or whatever it might be? And um, just just check out the local council's housing policy. In fact, if, if you wanna if you wanna just stick a council's name in the chat there, I'll I'll go through that. We'll just Google it together. And and you know, although every council's got a different policy around this, they all have to have they all have to give reasonable preference to people who've been accepted as homeless. Assuming they're eligible. If you're not eligible for assistance, you don't get anything. But if you're eligible for assistance, you essentially, you know, if you're owed the prevention duty or the relief duty or the main duty or whatever, or I think even just as being accepted as being homeless in the homeless application process, then you have to get reasonable preference. Um, which 
might give you the lowest banding so it might not actually be in use to you in the real world but it does mean you have to be on the housing register so you shouldn't have to basically be making a separate housing application if you already made a homeless application it should happen automatically um that's not to say it will but it should do so we'll um i'll keep an eye on the chat there and just see if, if the council's name comes up and as i say we'll just kind of go through it together and just kind of find that the answer out together i think sometimes though although you don't have to make an, a separate application you would have to fill in like their form for that system so it, it potentially would feel like another application um but also but like so in Bedford, I'm not sure if it's still this way, but it used to be a separate team that dealt with sort of the the housing applications, like the housing register applications, which was actually a bonus because if you couldn't get hold of your housing officer, you could email the my home options team and say, Oh, you know, my client's struggling to log on to this. If the banding's wrong, the you know, the whatever it is, I can't seem to bid or whatever issue. Um, you'd often get quite a, a faster response yeah um so the person just put northampton i don't know if that's north northamptonshire or northampton or west northamptonshire but we'll go with west northamptonshire because that's where northampton's in so um let me share the screen uh blah, blah, blah. here we go so i just literally googled northampton west northamptonshire um housing allocation scheme which is the technical word for this and here we've just, it's not in a PDF, it's just all here. So um, basically, I'm just looking for the bit that says banding. Um, Shannon, if you can see it, shout. Uh, this is really annoying. because The good thing about when they do it in PDF is you can search for it. If I search there, it's not, it's going to give me something completely different. So I'm just trying to find out. So what uh, what, when, what are the main, where, are we, I just want to find the actual housing allocation scheme. Let's try it here. So they just give me lots of other stuff, which isn't um, what I want. Awesome. No results found. Um, so that's, uh, let's just go back to Google. Hold on a sec. Let me see what I can do. It's not usually this difficult. Most councils, if you just Google those words, you will just get the, um, yeah, you'll just get it straight away. And if it's a PDF, it just means you search for the word banding and then you find it. Uh, or oh, I think I might see it. Hold on. What's this here? West North Hand scheme. Oh, no, no. Oh, gosh. Well, we should probably feed this back to them. <laughs> this isn't this isn't very easy to navigate. Um, here we go. I think I found it. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, cool. So I just clicked on the what is a homeless allocation scheme and it's given it to me. So, And it's in the PDF, which is awesome. So let's just get this back up and run. Cool. So again, what we're going to do here is just search for the word banding. And if we don't get anything, we're going to go to band. So, okay, banding. So we don't want that yet. We want some more. Is that it? One. Let's go back to the contents. Assessment of housing needs. That would usually, oh gosh. This, here we go. But here, here we go. Prior to, so, okay, band A. So let's just go down to, um, so back this is as I say, this can be different in every area, but my point I'm making here is that you can find it out reasonably easily, usually more easily than I have here. So band A, you get band A if you are owed so homeless household owed a relief duty under section 189B2 and likely to be owed a remain duty if the relief duty ends unsuccessfully. So that's that's an interesting kind of bit there. I haven't seen that in policy before. So they're basically giving you band A if you are in the relief period and likely to be owed the main housing duty. You've then got, um, I'll go down to band B because it's probably going to, I know what I know what it's going to say here. Still band A, um, still band A, blah, 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 still band A. So just to give you an example of what else they're putting in here. So um, care leavers who are um, owed a duty of care by the children's, uh, under the Children Act. It's ch yeah, they said Children's Act there, it's Children Act, but anyway. Um, so I'm just being pedantic. So yeah, and, and they're kind of, they're ready to move on. Um, release uh, releasing an adaptive property so if you're living in adaptive property you don't need it you get band a a supported move on you get band a so then we go to band b and so here we've got applicants so that's homeless applicants owed one of the following homelessness duties or are sleeping rough and do not wish to make homeless application um so where you're so this one so section 190 is the duty to people who are intentionally homeless but in priority needs so you would get band b um this is the main housing duty here so um 
Oh yeah, so this is this is like the lesser main house. This is like a final uh, final part six offer essentially. Um, so relief duty where you're not considered likely to be in priority need. So again, the wording of this is all quite interesting because it doesn't really fit very well in with the wording of part seven, the homelessness application route. So essentially, um, let's see um, if we go back to the question: if you are homeless and you're owed the relief duty, you will get ban B in the West Northamptonshire Housing Register. So, and, and yeah, that and that's assuming you're unlikely to be in priority need. And if you're likely to be in priority need, not intentionally homeless, then you get ban A. So, as I say, they, that's that's they're not being nice. They have to have this in here. What is nice about it is that sometimes you'll get ban D for that sort of banding, but actually they've given ban B here. Now, if you really want to go to town on West Northamptonshire Council, you email their Freedom of Information team and you ask them what is the average waiting time of people in band B on the housing register or band A or whatever band you're in, and they will give you a number of days or a number of months or whatever. So that will give you an idea of how long you're going to take to get housed. And I would guess I, I haven't had direct um, kind of contact with West Northamptonshire, but I would guess that you're looking at May. I think I'll, I'd be confident you get housed in less than a year at band B. Um, so, yeah. It's probably with that FOI, it's probably worth including the bedroom need so if you've be if you're eligible for like a two bed just include that because the, the average waiting times for a two bed will obviously be different to five bed um just so you get specific to your circumstances yeah yeah so as i said hopefully that that's kind of that's that should be clear in the, in the sense that if you are in the relief duty at the very least you should automatically be on the housing register at band b and you don't need to make a separate as shannon says you might have to fill in a separate form but you don't need to make a separate housing allocation scheme you know house, housing register application it happens automatically as part of the homeless application now it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get social housing because they can still discharge that those duties even the main homelessness duty into private rented accommodation but it needs to be decent and it needs to be a 12-month tenancy if it's a main housing duty so so but but yeah, as i say it doesn't just because you're in the, on the housing register does not mean you're you're going to get social housing and so what you should certainly not do is reject an offer of private rented accommodation in these circumstances because the council can then wash their hands of you all together so yeah i'm, hope, of, I'm hope, hoping that was helpful sorry shannon out, out of interest does it say um how many bids people get between mm. like band A and band B? Because that's often another thing to look out for. Because I'm surprised that you can be intentionally homeless and still be in band B. That seems like you say normally it's sort of like band D. And I'm just wondering if there's like not that I'm expecting it to be <laughs> to be worse, but you know, if you are whatever, then you won't be able to get as many. Yeah, I'm just I've just I've searched for the word. I'm just, there seems to be there's only one reference to bids as well. I don't know if my PDF, my uh, Adobe's working here probably. But anyway, so you've got um, uh, so this is, this is just explaining the, the kind of the process. So it's once you get your banding, you you can bid on vacant properties and you'll kind of get prioritised. I'm not going to read it all out. So we've got bidding again. Most applicants will be required to bid for a property if they want to be considered for it, and may bid for a maximum of up to three properties per cycle. I'm trying to work, just let me see if there's the word auto bids on here. Because some councils, they'll basically give you one chance to bid on something. If you don't get it, they'll give you auto bid, but it's not mentioned auto bid in that, using that word. But again, yeah, so as I say, obviously this is just West Northamptonshire's policy, but every area will have a policy which will be structured like this. It will give different banding to different you know, different kind of circumstances, but they'll all be one. So yeah, actually, as Shannon said there, so here we go. So band A, um, if you're in band A, uh, you get a direct offer. I don't quite know why. I'm not quite sure why. I uh, think that which... means auto bid because they yeah. used manual bidding down below. So a direct offer, I'm assuming, is them giving the person a direct offer and you only get one offer, which yeah. means you have to. Yeah. But then they've set up to three bids. But I don't, I don't know. I don't, yeah, as I say, we, we don't need to know here, but it's something that the person living in, in Northampton would want to know because – yeah, some places they give you no choice at all, in effect, and other places they give you a fair amount of choice. And you notice here, um, so they're differentiating for those in band A, they're differentiating those who are owed the main homelessness duty because they're essentially, I mean, they're basically trying to remove choice. They're trying to incentivize people not making homes applications. So they'd rather you didn't make homes applications, stayed with family and friends for however many months, and stayed on the housing register that way 
than to actually make a homeless application. But in my, if I was homeless, I'd still definitely make a homeless application because that's the quickest way to get a roof over my head. So yeah, hopefully that was that was a useful example of how this works. Um, we don't have any further questions in the chat, so this might end up being a pretty short live stream. Um, so we'll we'll take a couple of minutes just to see if there's any other questions coming in. And I'll fill the time, as always, by advertising the training we do. So our next date with Space is the 10th of May. I've just put the advert out on Facebook, so I imagine it's going to fill up fairly quickly. If you want to just check that out, go to the Eventbrite link, which is on – if you go to the YouTube channel, it'll be there somewhere. Or if you search for Homeless Best, Best Practices in Eventbrite, you'll get it as well. And then we just set another date as well for the 14th of June, which is all the same sort of stuff. So we're just going through – how to make a homeless application, what the law actually says about homeless applications and things like what, you know, what the definition of priority need is, what the definition of intentional homelessness is. All online actually works pretty well. In our experience, we get really good feedback all the time. So, yeah, we just got we got up to 4.9 stars on Trustpilot, which is quite difficult mathematically because you start off with seven, three and a half star reviews before you even start. So that's why you don't get five stars that easily. Um, but that's what we're working towards anyway. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, check that out. Other than that, Check out Garden Court Chambers' um, YouTube channel because at some point soon they're going to put up a video of an event they did last week, which is really interesting around uh, kind of like recent cases of, of uh, significance. Uh, and there's a real mixed bag of kind of good cases and and kind of quite negative cases, but you know that's where things are at the moment. So it's, it's a good bit of information. Um, so um, got a question just come in the chat. So. Um, Someone who was found intentionally homeless and child services said the children are not in need. I think this might have been one where the, the family were then staying with the grandparents or something like that. And I, I guess the children's services are saying, well, you know, you're adequately housed in, in, the, you know, in the grandparents' home. So I've not done it myself, but you can challenge children's services decisions. Um, and if the relationship with the, with the grandparents breaks down, then obviously – you know, and, you, and they kick you out, then yeah, you know, the, then that person would be, would be, you know, that child would be a child in need again. So, yeah, I think that's um, yeah, it's okay. They're saying that the appeal panel want fourteen years of medical history and bank statements. The medical history isn't a problem. Um, dot dot dot. Um, but the bank statements can't go back that far now. So with a bank, obviously, um, when you yeah, you know, with a normal bank, you can get up to twelve months or whatever without much difficulty. But because it's your personal data, if, if you've had a bank account for 14 years or over 14 years, you can do what's called a subject access request to the bank. Any organization that holds your data has to give um, give your data to you. It's your data. So you can say, they might say, oh, we, we don't go back that far. You say, well, yeah, you do. We just need to we'll call it a subject access request and you'll get whatever period of time you ask for. So you'd have to do it for all banks, all, all accounts that you had in that period and you know, I don't know about you, but I kind of change accounts fairly regularly to get little bonuses and stuff like that here and there. Um, so, yeah, you might just want to you might have to go to multiple banks to get that full history. But, you know, if the panel's considering it, that's the route to go down. Get that get those bank statements as soon as you can um, using the subject access request. If you make the request tomorrow, they've got 30 days from tomorrow to actually provide the information, but they could do it much quicker. I think if you said to a bank, if you walked into a bank and said, I'm homeless, you know, this is my situation. I need this information. Can you fast track it? There's a chance that they actually would, and they provide the information well within that time period. It's not difficult for them to do. They just obviously don't want to give out reams of paperwork every time someone comes asking for it, but they do have to give it. So yeah, um, hopefully that helps a little bit. But yeah, kind of just go, yeah, just if you're at the, that appeal panel, give them everything they ask for um, and, and you know, kind of get politicians involved if you haven't already. Um, so next question. If you want more than um, if you want more uh, so one more than what are the right so hold on a sec if you want more more I'm trying to work out what it's referring to okay bear with me guys so okay so um, I need to I'm just trying to work out. Oh, sorry, I missed a bit of the question. That's why I think, or have I? Shannon, can you make sense of that one from MA? So I think it's the person, so someone's in TA, they're challenging a homeless application, and I think the council's basically saying, we don't owe you a duty, please leave temporary accommodation. 
And I don't know if they're asking, like, if you want one more, is in go round or another local authority or what, but they've asked, like, do they, does he have to leave? What are the powers to remove him from the property if he chooses not to go when the letting agency are managing the property for the local authority say they're going to come and change the lot? Person's vulnerable and only just out of hospital in the last two weeks and the local authority are refusing to review no statutory duty to do, do so. So I think if I'm reading that right, in this situation, you'd make a fresh homelessness application to the same local authority based on the fact that new information has come to light. Like they've just come out of hospital. It's a new sort of situation and almost just start the process again. But that would so depend on why they're evicting him from TA. And if it's down to priority need, then absolutely make a fresh application because it's a new relevant fact. But if, yeah. say, they've said intentionality, then it it doesn't seem like it would be relevant to make a new one, but you could still challenge the intentional homelessness decision. Yeah, I think I, I'm just trying to work out what the re, what the council might be saying. The fact they're saying that there's not um, a right to review. Um, so they're saying there's no statutory due to... to review the case now i can only imagine then that that might be about the i don't know about the suitability of ta in that kind of interim period because if it's a if it's a decision that you're not in priority need or it's a decision that you are intentionally homeless then there is absolutely a right to get to request a review or about local connection or about various other things as well so there is a statutory duty uh, they can't they just can't end the duty so i'm not quite sure the other thing they might be saying is if i guess they might be saying that there's no reason i don't know i can't i no, I wouldn't say. I was going to say that there's no reason it might be in priority need, but then they wouldn't be in TA anyway. So they'd have to issue a decision that they gave them a right to review. Um. So, yeah. Um. I, yeah. It may, it might, that that question might need just a little bit more detail for us to give a sensible answer. So whilst you're doing that, let's just go back to a question here. So, um, how can someone appeal a relief duty? This was given after they approached the council because of domestic abuse. The problem is that they're in. Band four on the allocation policy. Uh, this is unfair. It says domestic abuse should be band one on the allocation policy. Okay, so I think I, I have an idea what this might be about. Um, you, if you're able to put what council it is in there, I could probably explain it even better because we're going to go and have a look at their allocation policy. But a lot of councils, what happens is they'll in, in, they'll have a band one which will say people in immediate risk of domestic abuse, and then it will say. People that make a homeless application will be in band four, as it seems to say in this one. And then what often happens then is once the main housing duty is actually accepted, they'll move up to like band two, you know, something like that, band B. And this is crazy because it massively incentivizes people to stay put at risk of domestic abuse because they then get band A rather than having to go through the whole, you know, around the houses, um, no pun intended. Um, so I think... Yeah, you just need to look at the detail of, of what that pol that council's policy says. Um, but I think that's what's happening. Essentially, you've got a council's policy, which is ridiculous and should have been challenged by the professionals in the area a long time ago, um, because it's it's actually putting a perverse incentive for people to remain in at risk because you then get so the higher banding. They've just said it's Barnet Council. So, OK, so let's just try and multitask. So I'm going to just get on, try and find Barnet's housing allocation policy. I think they said that they they should have been maybe in band two now. But yeah, they were. Yeah, so, into... so what one one of the problems might be is that they kind of they've been in relief duty for more than fifty six days and the and the council's just not been quick about it. Um so in that case you just need to complain and say why haven't you made a decision yet? Um so let again I'm just gonna try and find it before I bring it up. Uh okay. Mm. See if I can find the contents here. Right, yeah. And it's on, so this one's in an annex. So let me just find the annex one. Right, here we go. So let me share the screen. Here we go. So what's going on here? Uh, right. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to do it on the screen. Right, okay, here we go. So, um, Annex 1, Barnet Housing Bands. So, we've got Band 1, which is Emergency Medical Disability, Reasonable Preference Category, Section 166A. I don't know what that refers to. 
So where you've got you've got basically terminal illness, um, life threatening illness, uh, severe health issues caused by accommodation likely to be life threatening, severe mobility issues, um, blah blah blah, deteriorating to health. You've got exceptional circumstance. This is still band one. So um, current so applicants who are currently experiencing domestic violence in their home or have had to leave their current home place to a place of safety in emergency temporary accommodation allocated by the council. Okay, so this is interesting because I think this person this person asking the question might be right. Um, because in one sense, if you're in emer you know, emergency accommodation is not a technical term, but I think they mean interim accommodation here. So you should have been offered interim accommodation. And this is saying that, yeah, you should be getting banned you should be getting band one. I think what the council is potentially doing is they're just treating you as an, you know, an, an ordinary ho um, homeless applicant and they're kind of taking you down to band four or whatever. So let's have a look what bands four has got. Um, no, not a lot. Hold on. So you've got reasonable preference categories. I think this is, this is going to be, uh, this is, this is weird how they're doing it. I'm not going to, be able to give a very um, kind of clear explanation of this here because they, they seem to be mixing things up here. I'm trying to just look for, yeah, uh, I don't know. Home, yeah, here we are. So, so band two, you get homeless households owed full duty under under section one nine three. So that's what you, any victim of domestic abuse is going to get that duty at some point. But I just want to try and find um, relief duty. See if it says that. Um, it's not take me out of it. Hold on, that's not what I wanted to do. Where's the other one? No, okay. So that didn't help at all. Um. This is, so essentially, the answer to your questions in this, you might well be right, and you might just need to basically write to the council, you know, complain to the council and say, I've made a homeless application, I'm in interim accommodation following domestic abuse, and the Barnett's housing policy says very clearly that I should be banned one. And you'd quote whichever bit of it I just found that says it. Um, so this bit here, you'd quote this bit here. Essentially, it's not numbered, which isn't very helpful, but you just kind of question, you know, quote the bottom of page 27, and you just highlight this bit. And and that's and I think that would probably be enough. I would say that's that should kind of get them uh, working. And you could potentially also again involve politicians in that and just kind of make the point. So again, I've obviously only just gave a very shallow reading of this, but that's how I'd interpret this particular policy. And I'd say, yep, yeah, you're right. You should be banned one. Um, the fact that you're not might just be down to poor staff training or something. They just don't know what they're doing. So you just need to raise it with them basically. And it's important. So you're absolutely at liberty to complain to the chief exec. Um, so yeah, hopefully that's um, that's helpful. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. That, that, so that's what I would do. I'd be complaining to the chief exec and saying, you know, policy says I should be banned one. Your housing officer says I'm not. Can you explain what's going on, please? Um, so yeah, and and um, there may also be like an internal review process for the actual housing allocation scheme. Uh, but my experience of using them is it's not very effective. It's just very clunky. So you're better off, in my experience, you know, in my opinion, just make better off making a formal complaint to the chief exec and just laying out that information. And, and um, yeah, hopefully you're going to get a more sensible response from from back from it. Really. Um, so let's see how we're getting on. Um, let me see if I can make more sense of that previous question. Uh, so okay, so per, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, this is not a very um a, a good kind of uh, media for pro for kind of explaining complicated things. But yeah, so um, the the person was in interim accommodation, requested review, which was declined, then found no priority needs. Applicant requested review and accommodation during the LA declined and issued notice to quit. Okay. Okay, so so essentially, I think what's happening there then is the council is saying that they've made a non-priority decision. And they're essentially being really stupid and and, and kind of pig-headed. They're saying, oh, you know, the new information that you've had from the hospital visit, it doesn't have any reasonable prospect of it. Yeah, they're basically saying it's not significant information. So um, uh, do you know what? I might have to kind of fall back on the, the default. You might need to get a housing solicitor into this situation because you might just need to kind of throw some legal weight and write to the legal team with it. Um, I've had that situation before from, from Bedford um, a couple of times maybe. Well, they're just, as I say, that the review officer was basically just had loads of pressure on them from above to to make a stupid decision. So they did. And they said that this person, there's no reason to think that the new information might change that decision. But it's a very low threshold. It's, it's yeah, Shannon already said, actually, 
you might just be better off making a fresh application and starting it again. But you've got the same problem. If they're being pig-headed, then you, you're going to have to get some more teeth. And that could be about you complaining to the chief exec, or it could be about getting a solicitor involved. Because, yeah, if someone's been in hospital, it's highly likely they're going to be in priority needs. There's going to be something about them which differentiates them from a healthy and robust person by definition. And most health issues, let's face it, are going to get worse if you become homeless, which is kind of the test. So I think that's what how I'd say is I think or sorry, Shannon. I was gonna say you could do both though. So you could make a fresh application whilst complaining to the chief exec, going down the complaints route from the previous sort of homeless application. So you could sort of do a yeah. two tonged approach, which would hopefully mean that person is not without accommodation for that yeah. time being. And again, if you need to make safeguarding alerts, make safeguarding alerts just to it's very likely nothing will happen from that but it helps build that picture and again it's it's that new fresh relevant information yeah so yeah if, yeah if, again i think that's a good point if i if i was working this in this situation i would raise a safeguarding alert because effectively what the housing officer is doing is they are ignoring medical advice or they're ignoring medical information and the email you're going to end up having to send whether you trigger a fresh application or not is you need to Get hold of the original decision that they made, the original non-priority decision. Look at the wording carefully and then see if there's anything new that the new, the latest hospital visit re revealed. And it will do because there's been another hospital visit. So clearly the person is even more unwell than they were before. And that's effectively the argument you need to make is the decision was based on X, Y and Z information, but there's now A, B and C information available as well. Therefore, this is new information, which is more than trivial. That's the kind of legal threshold. And therefore, you know, you should be you should be kind of you know, ex accepting that there's a duty to provide nothing else, provide accommodation whilst that review takes place and whilst they make those inquiries. But I have a feeling that you're potentially dealing with a with a very stubborn housing officer who's not really willing to see sense, which is why you have to kind of you know call call a lawyer on them to kind of get them to to behave, or try and you know run through the complaints process, try and involve politicians and try and do it that way. But if you're going to go to a politician, you need to make the same argument. You need to explain why it is your right. So you need to say, you know, kind of the, the, the case all you need to quote is, I think is Mohammed V. Southwark. And in that case, it basically said, you know, when you're making a review request of a, of a let's say, a non-priority decision, if you provide more information, which is more than trivial, I think that's the wording, that might make a noticeable difference to the decision, then they ha they should accommodate you pending the outcome of the inquiries or the, those th that review inquiries, as long as you ask for housing. And I'm pretty sure this person said that that's exactly what they did. They did ask for housing specifically. So you'd make the complaint based on that. I just have a feeling you're going to have a rough ride. I think they're going to dig their heels in, and they've already probably, yeah, they they they're, they're kind of they're kind of painted into a corner already. So if you've got a solicitor in who just wrote to the legal team and saying, you know house them whilst this happens or we're going to go to court that would probably be the most effective way of doing it but you still make the complaint because you you want to kind of give yourself some more teeth for future battles i guess i'd probably request a new housing officer as well just like to to get fresh eyes and a new sort of like now look they're all teams and what have you there'll be friendships within those teams but to help the client feel like potentially there's a bit more of a fresh start requesting that new housing officer um can work really well it doesn't always but it can sort of go in your favor yeah um so the, i'm just going to share the code of guidance just to kind of again you, this might be stuff you want to quote um so uh here we go so it's eight or 18 point something uh 18.10 or something i can't remember let's find it uh further application so this isn't the muhammad bit yet but we'll get to it so um where a person uh whose application is pretty blah blah blah, blah. um so uh let's just highlight so when a, uh, where a person whose application has previously been considered to determine under part so makes a fresh application housing authority will need to decide if there are any new facts which render it different from the earlier application um if no new facts are revealed or any facts are of a trivial nature and being in hospital is not going to be trivial they uh, would not be required to take a fresh application. Now, although this is talking about fresh applications here, it's effectively the same threshold to ask for or to be housed pending the outcome of a review. Um, I'm trying to think where that would be in the code of guidance, but uh, let me just, just Google Mohammed B. Southwark as well, just to check I'm not tripping. Um, I think it's that case. Um, and I think it's spelled Mohammed. Uh, 
And it's the, it's the kind of power to accommodate. That's what it's called because councils don't have a duty to provide in, uh, accommodation pending the outcome of the review, but they have a uh, the power to. And this case, this kind of case law illustrates it. So um, here, we, let me here we go. So it's a nearly I found a nearly legal case about it, so I'll put that into the live stream. Um, or will I? Uh, I'm gonna have to do it in the roundabout way. Hold on, guys. I'm getting there. Um, so this is probably gonna mess up my audio for a minute. Uh, here we go. So I'm gonna put it in the chat here and then get out of it again. So just check out check out that that link I've just put in there. That will kind of give you the the ins and outs of the of the argument you need to make. Um, right. So, uh, well, I've done that one. Um, so yeah, just going back to the question about domestic abuse and, and the banding. If it was me, I would send. Yeah, if you Google the, the council's name and chief executive officer, it will tell you. In fact, I might as well do it now. It's Barnet, isn't it? So hold on. Um, Barnet Council, not spell Barnet Council. Not spell anything right now. CEO. Uh, so it's John Hooten, um, and I'm pretty sure. If I just click on this link, it will give the um, his email address because they have to kind of declare that. Or if they don't give the email address, you can kind of guess it, and it's going to be John with a H. Dot Hooten at Barnet. Dot Gov. Dot UK. So I'm but I'm pretty sure they'll actually publicise the email address on the website somewhere. They should do anyway. So that's yeah, that's who I send it to, and I'd copy in your your local councillors, um, you know, the portfolio holder for housing, the portfolio holder for adult services, children services if there are any children involved. And there might even be a separate directorate for domestic abuse. So you might just want to kind of have a little Google on, on the council's website around domestic abuse and see if you can see if there's any particular kind of, um, you know, kind of councillors that deal with that stuff as well. So, and copy them all in and the MP as well. Just quickly, because I've just Googled it and the chief exec, John Hooten, um, is leaving Barnet Council. But right. deputy chief exec, Kath Shaw, is going to take on the role um, so potentially still include John because uh, without reading this whole article about the wonderful things he's done, um, I don't know when he's leaving. Um, but just so you don't get sort of a a non response, um, include the deputy as well. Yeah, and in fact, you what I mean. So whilst we're here, I'm just going to Google Barnet Council uh, well, domestic had... abuse um, counsellor. See what happens with that. You never know. They've... They've put in as well that usually they don't respond, though. Um, I've not known the chief exec to sort of, like, not force a response from someone else, at least. Yeah. Um, like, they might not directly respond to you, but they'll make sure, like, a housing officer gets back to you or someone relevant does. Um, yeah. But also things like, and it sounds a bit silly, but customer services email address, I've had some real good luck with just emailing customer services because... They're completely separate to housing. Um, or if you can find a an email address for the legal team, you know, this is a legal process. There might be a legal at barnet.gov.uk. I mean, not always, but it's sort of just including anyone that you think might be relevant that has a bit of power to sort of push the result you want. Which is yeah. not like you're not pushing it in a bad way, just to throw it out there. Like you're just pushing for like the bare minimum of what you're entitled to. Yeah. But yeah. You've also, there's also a councillor called Councillor Sarah Conway. So Sarah without an H. Um, and I think she appears to be like, have some kind of portfolio whole, um, relating to domestic abuse. So potentially, and there's that even kind of information about surgeries you can go and meet her in. So potentially just do that as well. Go armed with your, you know, with the, with the allocation banding scheme, with the bit that you're making, you know, your, the argument you're making, but just, just try everything basically and if you've got any any support services involved like uh, you know an infra or something like that or a, a women's center or something like that then then again that would be potentially you know they, they if, if they're a decent service then they'll be prepared to kind of make a fuss about it because you know you, it, it's the way the law should work basically councils can't sort of uh, wave their hands and say they don't have enough money to do it they, that's that's not the way it works so um yeah let's just check we haven't missed anything um done that one done that one yeah so yeah just in that last comment they usually they don't respond though just 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 escalate it every time they don't respond so copy in the mp just get everyone aware of it 
that that kind of that is anyone who's relevant to the situation, and hopefully they'll kind of you know kind of guilt them into actually making a response. That's kind of yeah how it how it how it seems to be sometimes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, and and potentially start you know, that if nothing else, that complaint. Just in kind of talking about that for a second, if you make a formal complaint via email to the chief exec or, or whoever, um, e if they don't respond, it doesn't help you out in the short term. But when you finally get through to the LGO in however many months' time, you can basically say not only did they not give me the right banding and kind of left me with uncertainty and distress, but they also didn't respond to the complaint process properly. You'll get a couple of hundred quid just for that because the council hasn't, you know, kind of dealt with your complaint in the way they should have according to our own policy so although it's not going to help you out in the short term it might help you out in the longer term and it will help other people out as well probably in the same situation um so yeah cool okay so um i think that's all the questions we've had so far do you think i'm missing anything um and and just to make the point there so with domestic abuse and homelessness law it, it, there isn't kind of a risk-based system. So you're, it's, you're either at risk of domestic abuse or you're not. Um, and it could be relatively low-level domestic abuse that actually means that you're homeless. So you don't have to score a particular number on a on a dash form or something to, to be eligible for help. Um, you know, there might be particular concerns with particular perpetrators that, that the Marrick would get involved in or something and kind of recommend a move to a different area or something like that. But the actual risk itself is not relevant to whether, you know, the, the, the level of risk, you know, kind of whether it's medium or high or whatever, is not relevant to what duties you're owed under under Part 7 of the Housing Act. It's just the same. If the, the test is if you're at risk of domestic abuse in your home, then you're homeless, and therefore you're automatically in priority need, therefore you're not intentionally homeless, therefore local connection doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah, cool. All right, guys. In that okay. housing allocations policy, it doesn't say anything about low risk medium risk or high risk so again like yeah yeah okay cool well um we're nearly at half eight so unless there's some very last minute questions um we're gonna call it a night we'll be back next week with will um so we'll be three of us and i'll tackle those questions that came in in the week that i wasn't able to do tonight because they're a bit technical um keep the questions coming um keep yeah i, I guess i don't know what, what we're feeling tonight I think just bear in mind that that making a fuss about a council not following the law is is a reasonable thing to get annoyed about and to kind of push for. So Sharon kind of said, you know, pushing for, you know, you're not you're not you're not being vexatious or malicious or anything by asking a council to follow its own law. So yeah, just don't feel don't yeah don't kind of be apologetic for it. Um, and any professionals watching, just yeah, keep going, <laughs> keep keep doing what you're doing or whatever. And hopefully, um, at some point things might start getting better. Not anytime soon, what it seems. We we were talking um, before we started about the uh, the replacement for the Vagrancy Act, and, and I personally don't think it's going to happen because I don't think any Tory government is really going to be able to put forward that kind of legislation this year when they you know it's not going to help their popularity. So I think it's going to sort of uh, fizzle out really, but it's again a pretty bleak sort of stuff they're talking about. I think I think there's one bit in there about you know you can be arrested for smelling um, or something crazy like that. But anyway, cool. Take it easy, guys. Um, we'll see you next week.